God of War is one hell of a game. You know it, I know it, and Corey Barlog certainly knows it. Hello, my name is Corey Barlog, director of God of War. In a three-part series of director commentaries, he explained the significance behind key moments in the game, and here's the 20 most mind-blowing secrets we heard from it. And if you have not played God of War, spoilers abound. Go away, come back after you finish playing, and then I'll give you a little insight on how we made the game. Again. Kratos could have punched Balder harder. I really wanted him to get knocked way back. You would not like, so you could see the power of Kratos, really see him belt him back, but the distance he would have to travel in the no-cut camera was so long that we ended up really making it more shallow because it was just unrealistic. That he'd be walking for like five minutes. A key plot twist almost got spoiled at PSX. She's wearing a necklace that actually says Balder in runes. So... Early on when you meet her, if somebody is eagle-eyed and they make a screenshot, they're actually going to be able to see that. We had a physical uh, necklace for, for the Witch of the Woods uh, made for PSX. And we are all so busy. We didn't realize that the necklace said Balder on it until we were standing looking at it at PSX and realizing if somebody takes a photo of this and goes home and translates it, they're going to see that the Witch's necklace says Balder. Uh, and nobody noticed. It was like Kojima wearing the Death Stranding shirt before he announced Death Stranding. Super meta and nobody caught on. I was very thankful for that. Mamiya was going to be in a bag. There was a, a point in the game where Mamiya was not going to be hanging from the belt. Um, he was going to be in a bag because everybody thought it would be silly. Or not everybody, but many people thought it would be silly if there was a head hanging off the belt. And I kind of had to use a little bit of inception and some social engineering over time to give you a comfort with the idea that, hey, he's going to be hanging on the belt and he's going to be talking the whole time. Uh, they said, I worry that's going to get annoying. And I was like, no, if we cast this guy right, if we write him right, it's going to be great. It'll be unusual, it'll be different. It won't feel exactly like previous God of Wars, but it'll have that kind of interesting dynamic that I think great sort of fantasy films have had. And this is just no different. The boss fight was meant to be three times as long. The, the feedback we kept getting, and we were still looking for the right length. So this fight was probably three times as long, two or three times as long as it ended up in the final game. So many different stages that we had, and we just were picking, oh, that stage is not working anymore, we'll pull that out. Commando inspired this scene. This is such a, a, a blatant inspiration from Commando. You know, that, when I was a kid watching that movie and seeing Arnold carry this giant tree and the first tree that they gave me was really small and normal sized you know and I kept saying bigger and bigger and bigger and I wanted to go even bigger than this but at that point I think they cut me off and kicked me out of the office and said we're just not going to listen to you anymore Still want me to tie to um, the boat? but I was I wanted it to feel like you know the, there's Arnold carrying a tree but then there's you know Kratos carrying just, just massive tree and of course his son completely unfazed the usual suspects helped to cast Boulder. I was using the example in a lot of the auditions with everybody of saying, you know, I want something similar to the choice that Benicio Del Toro made in Usual Suspects. That he came in and he said, I'm going to play this character, you know, that nobody can understand what he's saying. He speaks really fast, his accent's super thick, and, and you know, he's got a little bit of a, a, a slowness to him, and that, you know, just everyone struggles with trying to understand him. But I didn't want them to mimic, you know, Benicio. I wanted them to come up with something interesting. And Jeremy, you know, I had a phone call with him early on, and he kind of just gave me a bunch of ideas of what he was thinking immediately, and I knew right away. I was like, this is it. This is the right guy. And what he brought was so much beyond what was on the page. It pushed us to actually go back and rewrite a lot of times just because his performance was so good. This ravine was meant to be much smaller. When Odin sent me here, this idea of they're going to be so strong, they're going to dig in so much that pressing against each other is going to split the ground and the, every part of the level is going to fall off. I remember when I first talked to people about this, and there was just this idea of like, yeah, that's never going to happen. Uh, and, you know. Everybody kind of made it bigger than I thought. Like, I suggested something, and I think they took it and went a thousand steps further and just made it amazing. Atreus's cries would wake Kratos up. And at one point in the script, you could hear Atreus kind of 
sobbing a little bit off in the distance and that was the thing that brought him back to reality and he kind of was following that sobbing that would lure the player back to the house but we found we just didn't need it the world is reacting to loki slash atreus being near death the world has changed you know the 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 red storm as we're calling it which is the epicenter right over their house is off in the distance and you kind of have this weird almost bluish gray haze everywhere it's the world is reacting to this imbalance the world is 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 reacting to loki being near death right and at this time you don't know he's loki spoilers and at one point my initial pitch for this was this was going to be the only time kratos was going to be brave this was where he was going to actually tell atreus everything he was going to unload it all because he had a captive audience who actually wasn't going to judge him or speak back um but then mamir was there so I realized, like, you know what? I don't think this is very good. And the writers kind of pushed back on this one. And they were right. Um, this was the time to be silent. This was the time to force the player to look at the unconscious body of Atreus, you know, and have a little bit of conversation from Mimir. A lot of people had said, you know, let's just fast travel. This takes too long. It's boring. And, you know, at the time, it, they were right. It's just gray box. And, you know, it did take a long time to boat. And there was nothing to look at. There was no music. It was very aggravating, and I think it, you know, is a testament to their faith that I kept saying, no, 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 we are not doing that. And as you're getting closer, you've already seen the indications of the red storm, and now you're going to go into the heart of the storm, right? And this is to really represent what's going on inside of Kratos. This is a physical, external representation of the storm that has been going on inside of him forever, right? And this moment, everything about this moment is about a pivotal character shift for Kratos his entire life the entirety of the seven uh, games that he's been in previously has been spent blaming other people for his problems taking almost no responsibility for anything that he's done in fact the only acknowledgement of it is saying I will do things for you if you erase the horrible things that I've done the stupid decisions that I've made which only further served to bond him in servitude to the gods there was a whole plan to have full sequences of hellwalkers fighting other creatures there's a great hellwalker up on the cliff just looking down at you it's kind of creepy saying nothing doing nothing just staring right at you and there was going to be you know animals and uh, creatures running around everywhere and just we ran out of budget and time but I think it's actually better again that's another one of those things where the limitations made it better it wasn't overwhelming you're taking all this in. It is the moments of quiet, right? Which is very rare for him. That he's doing nothing. He can't do anything but sit and wait for this boat to deliver him to the front of his house. It's a nice little, you know, sort of callback to the beginning of the game. Kratos is talking to you here. Everything is different, boy. And this this line. To dwell on it. So. Yes, sir. So much weight behind this line. This is like that line at the beginning of Iron Man 2 when Don Cheadle is a uh, war machine and he pretty much just says, what are you doing here? I'm here to deal with it. Let's move on. That line is all about that sense that everything has changed. It's a communication to Atreus as much as it is to the audience. It's Everything's different. Try not to dwell on it. Take in the experience. Roll with us on this ride. Kratos isn't ready to accept responsibility for his actions. The chopping of this tree down is uh, Kratos' wife, Faye. She had selected these trees, and these trees are very specific in the, the stave, the magical stave that is protecting their forest. She knew cutting this tree down would make them exposed to the entire Norse pantheon, to everyone on the outer world, and that was her way of saying that you know, Kratos sometimes likes to procrastinate, and given the opportunity, he's going to just stall as much as possible. And he's unaware of this, which is why he even tells his son, you know, you're not ready. This moment, like, this is really cool. I, I really wanted more of these kinds of moments throughout the game, the theme of the wounds that will not heal. So these burn marks on his forearms uh, have not healed since they were seared on his forearms all the way back in the first Found God of War game. And now he's even unable to Get in the show boy. his son just the wrapping of that, which is 
you know, wordlessly explaining so much of this relationship between these two characters. Atreus is saying an abbreviated Viking prayer. And this sort of abbreviation of the, the Viking oh, prayer for the dead was father. added on the set when I was just like, uh, I don't really want him to do the whole poem because we're taking place in the time before the Vikings, so oh, I'm imagining this is kind me. of the straw henge to the stone henge version of that full poem, and really all he's doing is, is calling out to his mother and his father as she's oh, being they ushered they off. Atreus's journey Kratos, begins with his parents. Snarf. At the beginning of this journey, a piece of his father, a piece of the, the memories, uh, the, the wounds that never heal are on his hand. He's carrying that throughout. And a piece of his father and a piece of his mother. Tree of Life inspired this scene. This is a moment in, in Tree of Life where Brad Pitt is teaching his kids how to throw a punch, which kind of is born... Uh, this moment is born of that, that, that idea of... Something so Kratos getting down on Atreus's level, Atreus being fairly disinterested and getting engaged further and further as Kratos continues to try to antagonize him. And this really is to illustrate how crap of a father he is in the beginning. Right? Like he is trying to give him a good lesson, but he's just really not that great at it. Blood is used sparingly on purpose. The blood happens when it's the most purposeful point for it to happen because it feels far more like jarring. This fight, the blood that, that happens during this fight makes it feel so much more tacked on, so much more real and a bit more shocking. But if you had blood the whole time leading up to this, it would just be, eh. I really didn't want the button prompt to ever come up here. I wanted people to have to sit there and Kratos was just kind of leaning against the, the log. Um, but we found that people would just sit there for quite a long time before experimenting with the button, so if you sat there for a little bit, we would actually have the button prompt come up. Tree of Life inspired this scene. This is a moment in, in Tree of Life where Brad Pitt is teaching his kids how to throw a punch, which kind of is born... Uh, this moment is born of that, that, that idea of something. So Kratos getting down on Atreus's level. Atreus being fairly disinterested and getting engaged further and further as... Kratos continues to try to antagonize him. And this really is to illustrate how crap of a father he is in the beginning. Right? Like he is trying to give him a good lesson, but he's just really not that great at it. Atreus's and Kratos's rage mode triggers when the other is in danger. Rage mode was triggered the first time when uh, Baldur actually threatened the boy. Like, I'm going to go find out who you have hiding in that house. Kratos goes into rage mode. When his father's in danger, Atreus instinctively goes into rage mode, but he's just not able to do that. So then that fuels Kratos' rage mode even more. And it just has this great kind of mirror dynamic, you know, that how far Atreus has come, but how far he has to go. Something I don't know if people pick up on, uh, but he stays in his rage mode until he actually picks his son up. So that he hasn't been able to calm himself down and it is actually picking his son up. That's the thing that calms him. That puts the fires out. He's worried about him, but actually making the physical contact, the thing that was so hard for him throughout the game, that's what calms him down. This sequence is a callback to previous God of War games. This whole idea is kind of the throwback to classic God of War, where every time you would get a new uh, weapon, magical power, any sort of new mechanic, we would give you the before and after. We'd give you the opportunity to experience before you had it, fighting a wave of enemies, and then after you got it, we would throw a bunch of enemies at you so you could really see, like, wow, that's changed. Uh, the way I interact with characters is so different. Chris Judge needed a hug after this scene. He went to a really uh, dark place to get here, and I just have been so in awe of his performance throughout this entire thing, but this moment... I just go up and give him a hug after one of the takes because uh, I asked him to do it like four times. So that's everything we learned from the director's commentary and I'm totally not crying by the way. Let us know your favourite God of War moment in the comments below. Click the box on the left for more content from us and don't forget to hit that big button in the middle for more gaming news, reviews, previews and features right here on Game Trader Plus.